With Chris. Chris. Okay, yeah. uh, so we're talking about the, the crankshaft. Just to be clear, light combing no, no, no longer allows you to straighten the flange. They're just like, we're not doing that. <laughs> Which is not to stop two guys at the sledgehammer and a stump from doing it. Oh, so. I have a little question about this. A little, yes. The taper crank? Taper crank on the, yes, the small continentals. Uh-huh. So if you get a prop strike, does the flange, you can just replace the flange? Is that possible? No, you're still required to do the whole... Right, but like, is it? Well, I guess my question is that: is it more <laughs> likely that you could save a crank? Mm, possibly, it's more likely, but in the Continentals, usually the slinger ring gets busted inside the engine. All right, so we got prop strike. All right, those are the things I wanted to cover right there. Uh, let's talk about cleaning methods. Yeah. Now that you're done cleaning. Um, so I can go pretty fast because we live in California, which, and especially in Sacramento County, which is very prohibited to a lot of stuff. I was just talking to the Croyal distributor. That's a maker of fine uh, products, lubricants, um, penetrating oil, stuff like that. And they're very kind and like to send us stuff. And I have plenty of Croyal penetrating oil for loosening frozen and stuck bolts. I said, I would love some Corrosion X. And he said, no can do. You live in California. The product, he, he said, I can ship you the product, but the packaging is not California compliant. So <laughs> you can't have it. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, how are you going to get it here? Anyway. Uh, it'll make it dry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So when I worked in aviation for a long time, uh, our main shop was in Clarksburg, which is in Yolo County, which was not quite as strict, so we could buy stuff there. But anyway, because we live in California, very limited to the amount of stuff that we can have. I believe we talked about in NDT, we talked about vapor degreasing as being one of the great ones. Um, I use the product called Turco, which I think might be the same stuff as, as B12 Chem Tool. Not the stuff, the carburetor choke cleaner, that stuff's nice, but the really, really stinky stuff. I think, did I talk about that? Yeah. I'm yeah, sure I did. Yeah, yeah, it was nasty, nasty stuff. You, you put engine stuff in this bath, and, and the next day when you pulled out the rack, we had, you know, we had it on a, um, what do you call it, block and tackle to pull it all out the paint would just slide off and the carbon, everything, just gone. Just rinse it off, which we did with water right there next to the uh, well, which is great. Okay, so things we have nowadays, we have the pressure cabinet or the hot seat cabinet. What is the danger of using the pressure cabinet? Paint. Uh, it's Uh, what, what about water mix degreasers or soap? We should just say soap. What's the problem with soap? They foam the engine oil, engine oil, but they get stuck in the pores. Can contaminate the engine and cause foaming of the oil. Foaming of the oils where it's all going to just get all foamy and not provide any lubricating properties. So that is bad. Um, let's see, what do I have here? Caustic compounds. So we have to be very careful. If, Honestly, this is not something I even thought about or nobody ever said to me until I went to Rotax where they said, you know, stay away from your non-aviation simple greens. Um, I'm a hot seat guy. I like the hot seat products. Ripper One, they have a high uh, caustic compound. That's not the word I want, I don't think. Maybe it is. Um, which can cause corrosion. So if you use it, fresh water rinse afterwards, blow it dry, which I don't think you guys did a fresh water rinse. But I also don't think there's much soap in there. I haven't put any in a while. So. Well, isn't that only for like magnesium, not really for aluminum or whatnot, basically? It's. Uh, I read something a long time ago and I can't find it. And I think it was Beechcraft put out a service bolt and said, stop using Simple Green. It gets between the plates of the aluminum and causes corrosion. Okay. Although, come to think of it, the one thing about Bonanza that they have that a lot of other airplanes don't is magnesium surfaces. So. So. Contains caustic compounds that can cause corrosion. Same 
same thing with power harness, you can get to it. Aluminum and magnesium. That turco stuff, if you put magnesium in the in, in it with other aluminum compounds, it would start to disintegrate. You get big old holes and stuff in it. It was pretty nasty. Um, can cause oil to foam. Although the soap that we use in ours is supposed to be a special soap that breaks down oils and is non-foaming. All right, what else do we have? Citrus cleaner. Yep. Safety clean with a K. I think it's clean like that. Safety clean. Uh, that, yeah, citrus-based, California, environmentally friendly, blah, blah, blah. Probably doesn't work. Um, obviously, you can get aerosol. I, I didn't have this written down. You can get aerosol stuff, uh, engine degreasers, things like that. You know, I said you can buy that B12 chem tool stuff that stinks to high heaven and it's a takes washes carbon off. It's pretty bad. The stink alone is enough to keep me away. Um, all right. So those are, are the basic things. Um, I don't know. We should put this. That's one of the things I wish we had is a Stoddard solvent tank. I've heard you can't get it, but then I called Remus Oil locally and they said, sure, you can buy Stoddard solvent. So we just get a 55 of Stoddard solvent and we had a, a wash tub thing with a pump that just sat on top of it. And so Stoddard solvent, it's, I don't know how you want to describe it. It's not like, how would you describe it? You probably know what it is. It's, it's a, a degreaser. It's a degreaser. It's not, it's, I like it a lot. Is that what you put in? Probably, yeah. You use some yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I want to. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what we used to use to, to wash off engines on the exterior. So it's a mild solvent. Um, it's petroleum based, so it displaces water. So in my shop, after we did the hot sea uh, pressure cabinet. Uh, we actually used another product. We changed it from that Turco stuff to it's called Ripper 2, which is yeah, it's just a heavy, high alkali. That's the word I wanted to use. High alkali uh, soaps are bad. And uh, I think it was a high alkali soap. And then we would take it out and, and uh, then put it in the hot seat cabinet, which had a lower alcohol high. Then we'd water wash it to get all that off. And then we'd solder solvent, which displaced the moisture and cleaned everything up with the final it's a nice final clean because we didn't have the safety clean. So, uh, let's see, and yeah, air dry it. All right, so whatever method you're going to use, that's what you got, and you have to live with it to get your engine as clean as you can. And the the object is to well, it'd be nice if you could strip the paint off, but this new stuff doesn't do it. And get the oil and grease off. Then once you have all your oil, grease, and big chunks off, what do you move on to? Blast cabinets, media, right? Which is what we did here, although you guys didn't because I didn't have you strip the paint off. And so you put it in a blast cabinet, which is going to strip all the paint off, blow out all the carbon, get rid of it. And why is that important? You have, it removes uh, material in case it's cracks or... Uh, What's going to come after we clean these parts? NDT. What kind of it? What? NDT. NDT, which we're skipping in this class, but you have to remember... After you, well, after your dimension check, or before, however you want to do it, what do you got to stick in here? NDT. Your NDT process, right? So what do we, your engine, think about what you have sitting there. What parts are we going to NDT? Crankshaft, camshaft, all the gears, connecting rods, um, rocker arms, I already said gears. Crankcase. Do the whole crankcase, do the whole accessory case, do the whole sump. Everything. Everything we're going to reuse, except for some nuts and bolts, is going to get thrown into the NDT lab. So we have to clean it properly, which you should know. We just have to circle around and talk about it and say, oh yeah, how did you clean stuff for NDT? Thoroughly. Thoroughly, right? And so we have different media type. 
Let me see. What so, when you're doing stuff like like tearing an engine down for NDT, um, obviously you're not going to do it all in one day. You have to recoat stuff with with like a with like a, a rust inhibitor or something like that. Do you, do you have to do that on the daily, or is there a way to like kind of? These are out of order. Sorry. Like you put it in a special cabinet or room or something that's dry. Um. Okay, so excellent question, and, and I worked on the river, and so things are very prone to corrosion out there. So when it went through the hot sea stuff and was water washed, we would then wash it with a stoddard solvent, which displaces water, and so it doesn't rust right away, but you had a very limited amount of time that you could work with it. So the question would become, how soon could I get to NDT? If I was going to do NDT that day or the next day, then we didn't want to put anything on it that would inhibit NDT because it has to go through the process all over again. But let's just say I'm backed up and I've got engines waiting and waiting and I said, hey, I can't get to NDT to, for two to three days on this. Then what we did is we used LPS 3. So there's LPS 1, 2, and 3. And this is hilarious if you don't know it. So LPS 1 is a very lightweight, like WD-40 kind of oil. Number two is, a, is heavier and it's more of a um, penetrating oil. It's like Lucin and, and you know, more heavy duty. LPS3 is none of that stuff. It is not a lubricant at all. It is a heavy duty rust inhibitor that puts a waxy coat on something. So I came in here one day and some guys were trying to fix a push pull cable, a throttle. And so they got LPS3 and they're spraying it down in there. And it's just, it's not getting any better. I'm like, you know what? By about tomorrow, you won't be able to move that thing with a press. Why? You know, they didn't want to hear it actually. So LPS3 is a rust inhibitor. You spray it on something and it leaves a waxy coat and it's super sticky and it's, yeah, not a, not a lubricant. So we would spray it heavily with LPS3 and then wrap it up in a newspaper or put it in plastic bags. Yeah. Did it stain? Literally everything it touched? No, no, it wasn't no. that. No, it's just waxy coat. But you can't NDT through this stuff. So three, four days later, what do I have to do? Yes, but because it's clean, we just go to the Stoddard solvent tank, which washed it off. So Stoddard solvent, blow it dry, set it in the NDT lab. So it wasn't too bad, but it just took an extra couple hours when everything mattered. So, um, see, there is this safety clean tank down here, this red one. These usually have carburetor cleaner that's pretty nasty stuff, and it's got a little agitator that just twists like this back and forth. All right, uh, let's see. So blast cabinet's what I'm talking about, blast cabinet. Uh, media types. Uh, these are the ones that would be familiar to me that I would have used. Garnet, glass bead, plastic, um, sodium, and walnut shells. My shop, I use the top three. And around here, we have some sodium and, and walnut shells. Um, I, Temple and Associate is the local blasting gurus, and they're really friendly. I've used them for since I got in the industry, and, and uh, I, was, I had nice blasters, and I kept them in tip-top shape. And there's nothing that frustrates me more is trying to use a blast cabinet that doesn't, you know, one walnut shell kind of comes out and pink, and you have to wait for that to fall down through and come out again. You know, time is money. And so my, my boost had to be operating 100% efficient with no holes, no leaks, good glass all the time. So I was very friendly with those people. So when I got here, uh, I tried to fix ours and needed some parts, which is, don't get me started. I don't want to start getting money until you do that. But anyway, and we were using sodium in the one that you guys now have walnut in. What is sodium? That is sodium. Baking soda is what I want. Yeah. Baking. We literally would have Arm and Hammer baking soda in it. Sodium bicarbonate. That's what I want. Sodium bicarb is what I should have wrote there. So sodium. So you can taste it. It gets on your gums and on your teeth. It's just this fine powder. And so I was talking to him like, so you have a sodium booth? I said, well, no, we have a booth with sodium in it. If that's what you mean, yeah. They said, no, 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 no. A sodium booth is a specifically designed booth for sodium. You can't put sodium in just any old booth. Because this stuff gets everywhere. It's too fine of a powder. I'm like, yeah, that's what's happening. I'm like, yeah, because you can't do that. So I dumped all the sodium out and said, all right, we are done with sodium. And I put in walnut shells. So. Uh, walnut shells and plastic. What's the name of the, the guys you like to work with? Temple and Associates. 1 800 Grit Guy. Okay. <laughs> is this sodium lighter? Is it lighter than the walnut shells? Like it's like oh, gosh, yes. It floats. Oh, yeah. 
Soda, like like, uh, like finer like a Arm and Hammer baking soda. It's actually with what are that even used for? Like what, what is for baking stuff? <laughs> well, you should know what is it used for in the shop. It is the antidote for. Oh, the uh, battery acid. Battery acid. Yeah. Battery acid. All right. All right. So, plastic and walnut are the same. In fact, I called them and they said, "Oh, it's really it's." Half a dozen ones that, you know, they said plastic's a little more expensive, lasts just a tad bit longer um, than walnut shells. Otherwise, I said they produce the same results. Uh, very safe to use on absolutely everything that I can think of, e even glass. It won't damage glass. That's why we don't have anything over the glass of ours. It won't damage it. Glass bead will damage the glass of the booth. So you're supposed to have a plastic shield over it and change it out and tear off all the time, which I can't seem to make happen here. That is pretty rough stuff. Um, in the shop where I work, one guy used glass on every freaking thing. You're not supposed to. In fact, it's gotten to the point where I think most manuals say do not use glass. Glass impregnates itself into the aluminum and creates a very abrasive so imagine if you glass bead a piston and then you have a glass impregnated piston which is gonna sandpaper. yeah sandpaper inside the bore so i've never seen problems with it i've never seen doesn't mean there aren't just means i haven't opened up and they go whoa look at that so many glass bead a piston well, no, you use spark plugs is that glass thank you for saying that that is glass oh no spark so that's another thing a lot of shops clean their spark plugs in a glass booth tempest says absolutely never do that because glass bead is so small it sticks inside, there's this little space in spark plugs and it sticks in there. And then you put the spark plug in the cylinder and start it up, heats up the glass, the glass melts and goes through the engine. So you're supposed to use the compound that comes with or is for spark plugs. Oh, yeah, that's a bag. Oh, you say no replacement. Yeah, so use the right compound, don't use glass. Uh, garnet will strip the chrome off a bumper. It'll, if you put something in a garnet, something that titanium in a garnet it'll shoot sparks off i mean it is nasty stuff uh we had it just for stripping the carbon off the end of valves just the face of them that's all, and that was about all you could do with it it was wow um like i said sodium i wouldn't use it sodium is so benign and non-abrasive that i don't know it just takes too long to use that's an engine himalayan rock salt himalayan what himalayan rock salt yeah oh uh, so blast cabinets, we had garnet. That's, that's a stone, a gem, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, glass bead. We had um, walnut shells. Um, plastic. Plastic is actually ground up acrylic. Walnut shells are actually ground up walnut shells. Somebody in my family, they're in the auto body industry and they knew the people, Lodi, like this Lodi Nut Company. And they were, he was, this is a long time ago. And he's saying, yeah, I was talking to, you know, Joe about this company. He said, they're actually making more money selling the shells than they were the nuts at some point. Mm -hmm. And then sodium, bicarb, oops. Sodium bicarb. All right, so those are our things. Now, I want to caution you. Boy, oh boy, do I want to caution you. Uh, the plastic that we use did not look like this at all. It was just white. That's interesting that it, this one's colored. Ours is just pure white. And I think it was about the time I transitioned into taking over the engine shop, and you know, it was kind of the new guard, and the old guard had left. Uh, I had a customer who I guess we had overhauled his engine. I had no, nothing to do with it. Who called me up and said, you know, hey, you know, you guys overhauled my engine. I've been sitting around a long time. We finally got the airplane done. Finally got it back on. You know, it's been a couple of years. Started it up. But I just want to tell you guys, man, you left desiccant in the engine. You know what desiccant is, right? Desiccant yes. are the spark plugs you guys pulled out. The the the, the, the funky shoes the funky little ones that it's the stuff that comes in your everything that says do not eat. All right, so it absorbs moisture. So those, those funky spark plugs that you guys pulled out, that's supposed to be blue. When it's dried, it turns pink as it absorbs moisture. When you see that it's pink, you're supposed to take it out and throw it away. And so he says, you guys left desiccant. And I thought to myself, 
mean, nobody in this shop was using desiccant. It's like, you know, I, you know, the old guy, I ain't using on that snake oil stuff in the desiccant. You're just charging the customer money for nothing, damn it. And uh, so I said, yeah, we didn't use desiccant, you know, and he said, the hell you didn't. And I, and I, you know, we talked and I said, could you bring by this desiccant? I want to see it. He said, because it turned green, man. I'm like, well, it's not supposed to turn green. That's not a color. So he comes in and he's got a whole sample of it and he hands it to me. And I knew instantly what it was. It was an entire handful of plastic bead that had made it through our Zyglo system, the green stuff. So what had happened is the mechanic who did the engine, plastic the whole engine, took it over to the, uh, I keep calling it Zyglo, dye penetrant, the um, fluorescent penetrant inspection, dipped it in the tank and did the fluorescent penetrant inspection. Well, he didn't pull out the oil gallery plugs. So all that stuff was packed in there the green went in and dyed, of course, the plastic, because that's what it does. And then it never got cleaned until they started the engine up, and the engine oil washed it through out into the oil filter, which I guess it caught it. But So that, you know, instantly I was like, okay, never in my shop will an engine go through this process without all of those pipe plugs being pulled 100%. So we actually had a procedure that after NDT, we would kind of repeat this process. It would go NDT, then the hot sea washer, and then we had a workstation outside, and we had a whole, like a whole pile of picks and all different kinds of blowers. Some were this long. And so you would sit there with a pick and a magnifying glass and a water hose and the air hose and blast water through every single passage, and you would pick, because those little beads actually go in the screw threads to the studs. They actually get, they'll work their way in. You got to pick them back out. And so it would take, I know, a crankcase, six cylinder crankcase, you'd spend a 15, 20 minutes, half an hour verifying that it was 100% plastic bead free before we move on and, and call it good. Because, yeah, you got you to watch that. It's not a problem until it's a problem. Uh, okay, inspections. So that's cleaning. I guess it's a good thing that. Yes, except I saw a video just the other day where somebody was using RTV. Everybody knows what RTV is, room temperature vulcanizing. Silicone, if you call it that, right? Yeah. Okay, a lot of mechanics like to use high temp RTV on engines in really, really bad places. And this particular little bit of RTV went through the oil gallery and went right up to that hole in the main bearing and stopped right there and plugged the main bearing, which overheated and broke the crankshaft and caused a crash. Not too much. That's so not too much. I know the adionics guys like to use RTV for literally everything, despite it being told not to. The only people who use RTV are the people who don't have to take things off after it. Yeah. All right. It has its places. It really does. But uh, yeah. Um, I like. I go to my hangar. I have some black. I love. First thing I do, buy some black RTV. Because all the baffle seals, the, the metal baffling that goes all over the engine, there's always little tiny holes. And I seal up every one of those holes. Why don't you use pro seal? So I mix a part A and a part B, and I've got a time limit on it. And, <laughs> and it's better. Uh, use some Honda bonds. That's nah, great. it's just fine. Why not just use some. Just use some five minute kits. Just some, uh, stop Lo. by Hobby Lobby and get a little pink glue gun and do it. I don't know. <laughs> All right, let's talk about some various inspections. I think you already have by passed most of this right now, but we have run out. What is run out? It's how round it is. No, it's not. That's seven, 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 seven. That's how bent it is. It is. Yeah. That's the true of the part. Run out, not out of round. So this is doing run out. You are checking how bad the shaft is bent. Just thinking somewhere in there, I may have the data on how these things are built. It's just incredible. When I went to Lycoming school and they talked about how crooked these crankshafts are and they just put them in a gigantic freaking press when they're like, I have the, the temperature, it's ungodly hot. They just press them until they're straight. Like, there you go, it's straight. <laughs> so that's run out, right? It determines lack of straightness, for lack of a better term. Run out determines 
Lack of straightness. Well, that's almost an embarrassment there. <laughs> I know, but I would worry somebody wouldn't know what I meant if I said it just to make sure it's true. Well, what's the opposite of true? False. So. That's good. We get to use words. All right, and again, everybody should have done your flange. Flanges on a crankshaft. Flanges on a crankshaft, they don't bend this way, so don't check it here, right? <laughs> they bend this way. That one's bent now. Okay, um, <laughs> run out. Uh, what is out of round? Egg shaped. How egg it is. Yeah, okay, we'll say that. How egg it is. It's a measure of egginess. Circular Difference between two measurements. And I know in, in 309 I told you this. If you're measuring something, yes, and you measure it right here, and let's say we got, oh, what is it, 2.125? 2.125. And this way, going this way, is 2.127. Mm -hmm. What am I going to write down? 2.125 plus 2,000. 2.125 in the out of round, OOR, is plus 0 .002. Okay, what did I just do? I coded this. I'm looking for this. I'm looking for the biggest or the smallest? Smallest on the inside. Right, if this is a crankshaft, let's say this is a crank, then it's going to wear down. down. So the worst of those two measurements is what? Smaller. The smaller. So I'm writing down the worst, and the out of round is two thousandths, but I'm coding it. It got bigger plus 0 .002. This is just me. It's something I do. And you don't have to do it when you're gone. But that way I can come back to this 20 years later and go, Oh no, it's 2.125 in the small dimension and then it went to 2.127. Because what happens if I put 2.127 and then minus 0 .002? Well, you're writing the same measurements, but you're taking the better of the two. And what if service limit was in effect here? So everybody follow that? Hopefully, maybe I didn't explain it the best, okay. And then if it's inside diameter, you wanna measure the bigger of the two. Okay, yeah, so let's just say now, will this do this, come on. This is the bearing that goes around the outside. Sweet. And I measure that, and it's uh, this way is 2.129. And this way, it's 2.130. Which one am I going to write down? OK, I got to write the 130, because it's getting bigger and bigger. So now I want the biggest number. So 2.130, and it got out of round. Minus. Minus. 000, 001. 001. Everybody follow my code? Mm -hmm. So now I'm left with the worst measurement for the crankshaft and the worst measurement for the bearings equals 0 0.005, right? Yeah. Okay. As opposed to what if I took the best and the best? And I said, oh, no, we want the best and the best, which would have been 2.127 and 2.129. So now the difference is only 0.002 versus 0.05. Well, yeah, it would be nice if it was two, but what's the reality? What is it really? Five, Five. Five is my worst. So we got to know that because what if it said the uh, service limit is three? Yeah, what if, what if it was uh, max service said 0 0.003? Well, then well I'm going to undersize it. I'm going to go to the... Is, is yeah. this one good or bad now? Bad. 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 bad, but I look at this one of the two and I say it's... Good. Good. It's but it's good. not good, is, is it? It's bad, and we want to know that it's bad, so we want to make sure we do that correctly. Look for the worst and write down the worst but code it so that you know the out of round. You can't just ignore it. All right, undersize and oversize. 
We'll do undersize first. Um, undersize is a part purposely made smaller. For example, in Lycoming, you would have a crankshaft comes out of the factory. And like I said, I don't remember the dimensions off the top of my head. So it comes out of the factory, and then they say you can have a 0 .003 undersize. So I don't know, nobody has a Lycoming measurements handy, do they? You guys are no help. So you take the manufacturer's minimum, maximum, and service limit, and just subtract three from each one of those. And that's three. And then you go three, uh, six, ten, ten. and 10. All right, zero, one, zero. I'm trying. Zero, one, zero. Uh, Continental's different. They're standard 10 and 20. Some crankshafts, not all of them. Used to be, Lycoming would let you go standard, polish it in the field, the three under, which was just fantastic, because you just take almost every crankshaft that came in that was just in a kind of, went to a serviceable standard, and you'd make it polish a little bit, you'd have a new minus three, you'd run it new minus three, then you'd have to send it out next time for a regrind to six and a renitride, and then a grind to 10. But they stopped it and said, "Now nah, you got to grind to three and re-nitride. Yeah. When you say you polish it three under in the field, would you have people pay more because it's new? You, you could call it a new part and say it was, what's the word? Would they pay more? No, it's like I never really gave them the option to say, hey, for an extra 50 bucks, you could, you know. I just did it. Uh, instead of overhauling, oh yeah, pay me three grand and I'll rebuild your engine. So they didn't understand that. That's something I probably should have mentioned. 99.9% .9 of pilots, if you said you're going to rebuild the engine versus overhaul, they probably get mad. I didn't pay for a rebuild. I paid you for a good overhaul. I'm not taking your crappy rebuild. What the hell's that? So no, they want an overhaul. So it just it wasn't worth explaining to them. Just overhaul to new limits is what they want to hear. So oh, fantastic. So. Um, but you can't do that anymore. So uh, like on crankshafts, like I said, you actually have to send it out. They use a grinder. They grind it to three under, and then they have to re-nitride, which is a process that I believe I talk about in here in a little bit, which puts, uh, you bake it at a very high temperature of the part in an ammonia. The ammonia impregnates the, it's not just ammonia, it's like ammonia hydrate or something, impregnates the metal, and it gives a hardness to it of a about seven thousandths of an inch, I think it is. This five to ten, let's say, and that makes it hard. That very hard surface, and it makes it also brittle on the surface. And so, like before, because the nitriding went about five to seven, you could polish it to three, and then when you went to six, you had to regrind because you're getting through the nitriding at that spot. Yeah, to go to six, too, to polish to six, you're using belts and stuff. You could get out of round built into it. Oh, I meant for the nitrating. It's hard to do the nitrating properly. Mm -hmm. um, so if I take a crankshaft and I grind it three under, what do I have? Do I just have now three thousandths more clearance between that and the bearing? Absolutely. <laughs> what do I have to do? Put a bigger bearing in the size. I've got to get a bigger bearing, which means that I need? Oversize. Oversize. Supersize, a part that is pur purposely, a part that is purposely made bigger. Made bigger, thicker. So I'll teach you a little trick. How do you know? Or you guys, everybody's already figured out what size crankshaft they have, right? And it doesn't have to be all the way across. You could have standard mains and minus three rods. You could have minus three everything. You could have 10 and six. Or the one thing that is the same though, all of the mains have to be one size, whether it's standard, three, six, or 10. You can't have different size mains. They have to be the same. You have to have the same size rod journals. So is anybody, what do you have? Standard, standard. standard. standard, standard. Does ever, anybody have anything other than standard, standard? I, I, I think we have 
three, three under. I didn't think. Right on there it says, you should know. I'll tell you right now, if you think that you, everybody in here is standard, then I think some groups are in for a sad mistake because you are not standard. I think there's a lot of not standards out there. There's a trick to it. You have to measure it. And I've already told you, right? As everybody saw in there, you were supposed to fill out a chart and you're supposed to figure out where you fell on that chart. Everybody's done this? Everybody not done this? You still have to do that. That's like step one, I think. Yeah. And you haven't done it yet? No, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't figure out what it was. Like, I couldn't figure out. It, it didn't fall within the limits of any of them. It was in between the standard and maybe one of the other sides. All right, well, I'll help you. But we got to figure that out. Yeah. Because you got to know so you can get the right bearings. Because the bearings are going to come in different sizes. Different sizes. So bearing for the minus three is going to say MO3. The bearing for this is going to say it's MO6 part number, and this is an M10. What's M stand for? Minus. Which part is the minus? Which part's the big? Bearing is bigger, but it says minus. So it's minus because the, the crank's been ground. It's crank's ground. So it's for a minus three crank. Oh, then we're almost three, yeah. All right, now you go, oh, now I remember seeing the bearings. Yeah, so there's the trick. All right. And that, you can do, there's a lot of oversized, undersized parts, a lot of them. Uh, they make a lot of studs in oversize for when the hole gets bigger, the, the goes in, you get uh, bigger studs. Um, there's a period of time where Light Company was making oversized um, rocker shafts. I don't think they do anymore. Um, studs, bearings. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are. Uh, I think oh, you can't shit. get. No, no. You bore it out. Go oversized camshaft. <laughs> yes, no. Where the bearings are, where it gets bad. So yeah. Um, oh, why? Why are the cams? There's not a like a freeze bearing in the cam location. Then there's in the crank. You know. Freeze. I can't answer that other than to say uh, uh, Franklin did it. The old Franklin engines, which they don't make anymore. And I've never, ever had an engine where it came in. I'm like, oh, if it wasn't for the cam bearings, they're always fine. Oh, really? <laughs> they're just fine. I mean, there's one in here that's got some damage from metal going through it. But other than that, I've never seen a damaged case from that ever. So it's hilarious. I know. You think, it, how hard would it be? Yeah, Sell some more. Maybe they consider it a failure point. All right, bearings. Well, technically, it's just something that facilitates movement between two pieces. So if you think about it, then bearings can be the inserts that you took out of the case and took out of the connecting rod. Those are bearings. Um, in a way, this is a bearing. It's also a bushing. Um, the, the, the hole that they provided in the case for the camshaft, which has no bearings, is a bearing. It's just part of the case. So with the holes for the tappets, all that stuff is a bearing. So Maybe it's just with like the camshaft on those since yeah. they're posed, you have both sides. It's uh, really forcing anyway. So. Whereas, like on those, they're always got a one-way force. Like Maybe something, something that facilitates movement that facilitates movement between two parts. So that can be anything, whether it's removable or not removable. It's a bearing. You have a thrust bearing in your engine. Where's your thrust bearing? Oh, it's on the, on the front. It's just built into it. It's yeah. just a piece of, it's a chunk of aluminum in the crankcase, and it's a end of the crankshaft, right? It's just, that's the thrust bearing. Well, you can't take it out. I know. Continental, you can. They make them removable. They just do it different. For replaceable bearings, what do they typically... Is there a generally accepted material like polyethylene? Yeah, we'll get into that here in just a little bit. Uh, bushings. Bushings. Uh, same as a bearing. Bearing, but uh, typically pressed into place. Pressed into place. Which then makes this bronzy looking thing inside here technically a, a bushing. Um, 
inside of this rocker arm is a bushing. bushing. All right. So when you say it's bushing, like it has to be pressed into place, uh, that's talking about like machine pressing into place, correct? Yeah. Okay. As opposed to what? Pressing in by hand? Using like a hammer? Strong. <laughs> like we have with, um, the bushings in the, um, or not the bushings, the bearings in the, um, in the crank case, like the pushing of the bushing. Yeah, but bushings are usually a round thing that's pushed into something. It's like one piece is one, split. Generally. Although, uh, the Lycomings are split bushings. I mean, this one may not be, but they are. It's just they're machined. It covers the, the split. All right, let's talk about some different damages. And oh man, I added a bunch of stuff here because this is all Q&A stuff. They want you to know the names of all this damage. And I'm like, oh my goodness. Why can't you just look at some and go, that's just not good. And right yeah, it's bad. Well, what is it? It's, uh, it's bad. You shouldn't look like that. It's got badness to it. They want to know for their reports and stuff. Or what caused it. Brunelling. <laughs> I feel the same way. <laughs> and the, the, the definitions, yay long. One or more indentations on bearing races, usually caused by high static loads or application of force during installation or removal. Indentations are rounded or spherical due to the impressions left by the contacting balls or rollers of the bearing. So Brunelling is like indentations from, from the balls. What balls? Ball bearings. Ball bearings, which we'll talk about a little bit. Uh, flaking. You don't show up. Uh, well, flaking is obvious. It's uh, breaking loose of small parts. Flakes, dander. There you go. I'm not writing that. Breaking loose of small pieces of metal or coated surfaces that are usually caused by defective plating or excessive loading. So breaking loose of small pieces. Usually on bearings, correct? Yeah, because bearings have a coating of all different kinds of material. Breaking loose of material. Um, fretting. This is a big one here to me. Fret not. No, I will talk a lot about fretting. Uh, fretting is one of the biggest problems in uh, for a small for an engine mechanic um, in pistons. Something you deal with all the time. Fretting is, and I think you guys should know this from film and sheet metal, is what? Oh, very good. Wow, you ever heard that word? It is. Micro movement between two pieces of metal, smoking rivets. Does that ring a bell? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's fretting. I remember looking at the definition up. Okay, so yeah. fretting is the slight, ever microscopic movement of two pieces close together, and it wears them out. And so where we get fretting, Is this is a machine surface? I usually, I have to remember to bring in the other podium instead of here. This is no, it's probably still too small. This is a machine surface here and here and here, and these are supposed to be tight and have zero movement. But when you don't torque cylinders down properly, you put the proper improper oil, improper anything underneath the cylinder as it goes down, whether it be paint, RTV, um, Pucky, or Pucky. Um, I have to say you put anything on there and what happens is eventually that torque on the cylinder relaxes a little bit and when that relaxes the cases start to move and then when the cases start to move you start to lose material right around here this case has some real good fretting on it I should say bad fretting it's not the worst I've ever seen but it's definitely not good this main saddle here is fretted pretty well that's rejection right there. And so what happens is you lose metal right here. Now the real danger of that is number one, well not the danger, you're going to get oil leak eventually because it's going to go past the O-rings, but let's just say eventually down the road some poor owner say, has a bad cylinder and has to have the cylinder taken off. So you're the mechanic that has had this class and you know better. And you're like, oh man, Kevin is always on. It's about fretting and proper torque. And oh my God, I'm sick of that guy. 
But you go out, you get the right oil, and you do it right, and you take that cylinder and you torque it on. You're like, oh, Kevin said, if you torque this side, you got to retorque this side. So you go on the other side, and you retorque that. In fact, um, on bolts that aren't anchored that, that float, we always double torqued. We had two guys do it, and there's one guy's really good. So we both do it at the same time. Click, click, on both sides. Um, anyway, you do it right. Well, what happens is because you're missing metal here, it's still in the front. and now you torqued it where there was now you're missing metal so what happens to the bearing you just lost clearance in here and you risk clamping that bearing onto the crankshaft no oil and no oil or you spin a bearing yeah it just doesn't really happen anyway. but yeah you i'm sorry it's time to go but anyway yeah you could uh, blow up an engine and you did everything right so threading is bad there's no right. So whose fault is it then? If you did everything right.